Okay, um, the other thing I want to point out for chapter two, there is a flashcard um, that I'm going to be referencing for this um, cash to accrual, accrual to cash discussion that we're going to be having for module six. Um, so uh, you may want to open that up so you have it available uh, when we look at it here in a couple of minutes. Okay, all right, good. So let's go ahead then with all that. And let's take a look at chapter two PDF. Chapter two. Okay. And um, I want to jump us to module six. Probably the best way to do that is in full screen. There it is. Okay, and there's a couple of different things that they have uh, talked to us about here, and I'm going to have to, no matter how much sun is not coming in, as soon as it could be nighttime when I start the class and the sun will find its way in my face by the time I really start trying to dig into the class, so let me close that. So stand up and do it. Okay. Okay. All right. So let's just go ahead and uh, take a look at the, and I'm going to have to close the other one. This is so irritating. I guess I should just err on the side of closing the thing. Okay. Okay, good. Now, there's a couple of things here at the beginning uh, that we want to keep in mind that we're looking at here. One is that companies will sometimes prepare their financial statements using something other than accrual basis accounting, classic example, cash basis. So you have a company that is not a very complex entity, maybe a mom and pop, could be a family trust, often family trusts, uh, which will be using quite a bit of money. <laughs> Some of these family trusts are very rich but their transactions are not very complex in nature. So it may be okay if they're not you know, making a financial reporting and invest in public for them to use cash basis, say accounting, okay? So if that's the case, then what we're going to see is that we will allow that and we'll um, see how the company will prepare those say cash basis accounting uh, financial statements, but um, we're going to see what type of reports, what are going to be the names of the reports for the balance sheet, the income statement. Uh, we can't use the term balance sheet and income statement for those because those are reserved for accrual statements. So we're going to have to understand the names of the financial statements that are used when we are using, say, the cash basis, tax basis, and accounting, et cetera. Um, the other thing that we're going to look at in this section is, well, if you have, say, cash net income, how would you convert that to, say, accrual net income? If you have accrual net income, how would you convert that to, say, cash net income? If you have cash revenue, how would you turn that to accrual revenue? If you have accrual expenses, how would you turn that into cash expenses? Now, what you're going to see when you look at that and when we look at that part, it really is more of an exercise than it is a theoretical discussion. So I'm going to give you a flashcard. It's going to tell you how to work your way through those problems. And then it's going to be up to you to practice quite a bit with those so that you get more and more comfortable and great, get greater facility with just answering those type of questions. On the exam, I could see, you know, you're having to answer maybe 10 points worth of questions that expect you to, to turn a cash net income into accrual net income, vice versa, revenue, cash to accrual, vice versa, expenses, cash to accrual, and vice versa. So you're going to have to practice with those. There's not a whole lot that I can tell you other than showing you how to do that and how to be consistent in doing that. And then it's going to be up to you to practice with that. Okay. So that's where we're going right now. But let's just take a look at some basic things here that they tell us. And they're calling these special purpose framework, and they call them other comprehensive bases of accounting. 
that have widespread understanding and support. And you say, well, widespread, you mean a lot of companies use them? Yes, you know, public companies, of course, have to prepare accrual statements in order to get an opinion on your financial statements often and go out to the investing public. You'd have to use accrual statements, although we'll, you'll see in the auditing course when you take that, that you could give an opinion on, say, a cash basis. But there are other bases for preparing financial statements that make sense. For example, as I've mentioned, the cash basis or something called the modified cash basis. Maybe, for whatever reason, an entity has chosen to prepare not their tax, well, they'd have to prepare their tax return following the tax basis, but then they'll go further and generate a set of financial statements that follow the tax basis of accounting could be perhaps a regulatory basis of accounting. So what's an example there? Uh, there were some years back where I was on an assignment where we were looking at how insurance companies were being regulated. This is when I was back with the Government Accountability Office, GAO, the federal government. And one of the things that Congress wanted to understand is the regulation of um, insurance companies as it relates to retirement annuities. Insurance companies, whether you realize it or not, are regulated at the state level. There is no federal regulation of insurance companies. And so what happens is each state has its own rules. And Congress was getting a little concerned that some states maybe had a laxed um, way of accounting or not accounting, but dealing with uh, retirement annuities. And they wanted our office to take a look at it. Of course, the logical answer there would be, hey, stop you know, letting the insurance companies control you through the hundreds of millions of dollars that they contribute to uh, campaigns and uh, you know, go ahead and regulate them, Congress, instead of worrying about the patchwork of 50 state regulators. Uh, but that'll be the day that Congress comes up with any kind of uh, campaign finance reform. That isn't going to happen. And if you don't believe me that insurance companies have a lot of money to spend to influence um, their customers in Congress, watch a football game one Sunday and see how many insurance company commercials come on trying to influence you to use their insurance. And that is not cheap advertising, I'm here to tell you guys. So anyway, um, but uh, that would be a good way to, you know, to make sure there's consistent regulation. But anyway, when we were doing that work as the accountant on the assignment, I was responsible for looking at the financial reports of insurance companies and seeing if I can glean any understanding about how they are structured from that. And when we looked at that, we saw that uh, insurance companies follow the statutory accounting practices that are promulgated by the National Association of insurance commissioners, and they have different accounting rules than GAAP. For example, certain things like office furniture are not capitalized, so that it gives a more conservative look of the uh, insurance company. And um, so unlike under US GAAP, where office furniture having future economic benefit would be treated as an asset for accounting statement purposes, they would not uh, capitalize uh, things like office furniture. And then a CPA would come in behind the company, the insurance company, after they file those um, financial statements with whatever insurance commissioner. And a CPA comes in and gives an opinion saying, yes, they follow the statutory accounting practices. OK, so there's differences in the rules between GAAP and some of these widespread other comprehensive bases of accounting uh, methods that you see here, OK? Now, when you take a look, and the key thing that we want to uh, remember, and the mantra that I'm going to be uh, sort of saying over and over again, is don't use GAAP, General Accepted Accounting Principles, titles for financial statements. So you can't call it the balance sheet. The rule is you can't call it the balance sheet. Even though you'll be preparing a balance sheet, you can't call it the balance sheet because that is um, reserved for accrual statements. So if you take a look, they tell us financial statement titles should differentiate the OCFOA statements from accrual financial statements. Okay, So you'd have what? You'd have a balance sheet and an income statement, but you wouldn't call them that. And I'm going to have you flashcard the names that you would give to these statements here in a couple seconds, okay? 
uh, the financial statements should explain the changes in equity accounts. Now, if you think about it, the income statement uh, and the statement of retained earnings actually do that, okay, to a large extent, statement of stockholders equity does that. But again, you wouldn't be able to call it that, you'd have to call it a different name. Statement of cash flows is not required. So there is no such thing as a statement of cash flows. So we'll have what? We'll have a balance sheet, we'll have an income statement, we'll have the equivalent of the statement of stockholders equity, but we won't be able to call them that because those titles are reserved for the accrual statements, okay? The disclosures, remember we talked quite a bit about disclosures last time, would be very similar to the disclosures that you would see in a set of gap statements. Remember we talked about the summary of significant accounting policies last time. And of course the big deal is gonna be there, what? Hey, we're using cash basis, right? And um, you know, similar disclosures is what you would do with gap, okay? Now, when we take a look and we talk about cash basis and modify cash basis, and let's start to take a look here, entities are not required to use accrual basis statements, and they may choose to present cash basis or modified cash basis financial statements in the case because they are simple to prepare, okay? Now, something that I can just see a multiple choice question on, so let's just flashcard it, Cash basis is not something that you would be using for a company that's fairly complex. So if we're talking about a mom and pop grocery store, mainly cash transactions, if we're talking about a family trust, even though there may be large amounts of money being thrown around in those, um, their accounting is not that complex. And so you might use cash basis for something like that. Now you come down and let's take a look at the cash basis financial statements and uh, let's see what some of the names are. And again, the mantra is what? Do not use gap titles. That's the main thing you need to remember here, okay? So when we have our balance sheet, our balance sheet might be called a statement of cash and equity. And then you can put AKA, or maybe not AKA, but maybe we use the word like, <laughs> okay? This is like the balance sheet, but you can't call it the balance sheet, okay? You call a statement of cash and equity. So they just really kind of start getting wordy with how they describe these because they're not allowed to use the gap titles, okay? Now, when you take a look at statement of cash receipts and disbursements, what does that sound like? Well, that sounds like the income statement, doesn't it? But we don't call it the income statement. Now, notice though that we have the revenues receipt. That's the actual cash receipt, right? Debt and equity proceeds. Now, wait a minute, if this is accrual, if you have what a debt or an equity proceed that comes in, that's going to either generate a liability or stockholders equity, but we don't have a stockholders equity. We're what we're just simply going to have. Um, well, we don't have debt and we don't have stock. So we'll have the cash coming in and that will add to the equity. If we issued stock, if we issued um, a uh, debt security, that's going to be what that's going to be uh, cash coming in and like a revenue. Proceeds from the sale of assets, okay? And we don't just book the gain, we take the actual proceeds, the actual expenses paid. These are cash payments, right? Debt repayments are like an expense. Dividend payments are like an expense. Payments for the purchase of assets are treated like an expense. Again, we're treating these as cash, okay? So again, most important thing is that you do not use the gap titles for these statements. And then we're gonna be taking a look in a little while to see how we would convert cash items to uh, accrual items and vice versa, okay? Now there's also something called the modified cash basis, which is basically a hybrid between cash and accrual. And let's just take a look at common modifications that are done if you're using um, accrual basis, uh, excuse me, modified cash basis versus uh, the cash basis. So common modif modifications include capitalizing depreciating fixed assets, 
accrual of income taxes, recording liabilities for long-term and short-term borrow, capitalizing inventory and reporting investments in fair value and recognizing uh, unrealized gains and losses, which we talked a little bit about that when we're talking about comprehensive income and we'll definitely get into that at F4 um, in a few days, a few classes looking forward, okay? So why don't you go ahead and flashcard some of these common modifications. I would ask you a flashcard that, that would you would do if you are talking about the difference between cash basis and the modified cash basis, okay? Again, guys, you're probably going to get tired of hearing this before we get done with this section. Do not use gap titles. Okay, I'm going to make sure I repeat that a few times. So the key thing there, what is the name of the statements? And guys, if you just remember that mantra, you can get a couple of easy points on, on the exam. Instead of calling it the balance sheet, we call it the statement of assets and liabilities uh, from cash transactions. Again, notice long worded titles for these, but this is like the balance sheet. Okay, statement of revenues, expenses, and retained earnings, okay, modified or cash basis. This is sort of like the what, like the income statement and statement of retained earnings combined, SRE is statement of retained earnings, but again, don't call it that. Okay, so just flashcard the names of the statements as they should be used uh, when we're talking about the uh, cash or the modified cash basis. And the key thing is don't use the gap titles. Okay, question. Okay, good. Now, as we mentioned, other comprehensive basis, meaning that they are widely uh, understood, income tax basis, okay, tax basis financial statements would be used using the same principles that were used to prepare the entity's tax return. For example, a, what, a write-off of a bad debt under tax rules isn't taken in what until the person actually tells you they can't pay that debt and you forgive that debt, right? Whereas under accrual accounting, we'll talk about allowance accounting, I think here tonight, you take that expense at the time of the sale, right? Okay, so those would be, um, you know, the types of things you would be doing if you were doing uh, tax basis financial statements. Uh, presentation, again, guys, I'm gonna write it one more time before you wanna throw something at me, do not use gap titles. I mean, that's the main thing, okay? Because what they'll do in a question is they'll say, which of the following would be a statement that would be prepared using the tax basis? And the incorrect answer is going to be the what? The gap title one, because there's really no set thing um, that they tell us that we have to use for the non-gap title. So they get start getting creative for the names of the uh, <clears throat> balance sheet and the statement of income and statement of retained earnings. We just don't call it that, okay? Any question on all that? All right, good. Now, this part is the part that I think um, is going to require you to really um, look at the flashcard that I'm going to give you Get comfortable with that flashcard, memorize the flashcard, and then you're going to have to practice with the problems that are given to be able to exercise these flashcards, and you're going to just have to keep doing that. It's kind of like me having you read a book about dancing, and then, you know, you're supposed to be able to dance, and the answer to that is what? You can sit here all day reading a book about dancing, but you don't learn how to dance until you do what? till you go out to a nightclub or something, you know, they have these salsa clubs where they actually open the place up an hour or two before. And the way you learn is by dancing, you know, having a good time, right? So I don't know if you'll have a good time with these, but you're gonna have to dance with them to get better and better at these. That's the best advice I can give you. Um, but I do wanna spend a little time practicing with you and showing you uh, some basic rules that you will use. And there's the balance sheet conversion, which is basically bringing 
items on that weren't going to be reported under the cash basis that would be reported under the accrual basis. So there's really not much to talk about there. And there's not many questions that focus on that. The questions focus on the income statement conversion. That's the big deal for the CPA exam. Can you take the net income and turn it from accrual to cash? Can you turn it from cash to accrual? Can you take revenues and turn them from, rev, uh, from cash to accrual, accrual to cash? Can you take expenses and do that? Okay. And so the best thing for us to do is at this point, look at this flashcard, which is in um, e-learning, okay, that I posted up there for you. And let's just take a look at what you're going to have to memorize here and get comfortable with and then practice with, okay? And then we're gonna look at some of the examples that are in the textbook to see if we apply these rules consistently, do we end up with the correct answer, okay? So if we're going cash to accrual, okay, what'll happen? And we're talking about net income. The company, um, the company, the question will give you what the cash net income is. And to convert that from cash net income to accrual, you of course will start with the cash net income. Okay, I'm just reading off here guys of what I put on this uh, flashcard. For current assets, do the same. That means that if the current asset increases, add the increase to net income. If they decrease, subtract the decrease from net income. Okay. For current liabilities, do the opposite. So if they what? If they increase, subtract them from net income. And if they decrease, add the decrease to net income. So you do the opposite for the liabilities. They will often give you depreciate. And by the way, not every single one of these rules is applied to every single question. Okay. They may choose some of the things to see if you know what to do with them. Uh, always subtract depreciation. Now let's stop and think about that one for a second. Depreciation is a non-cash expense. So if you were sitting there and you were preparing a cash set of financial statements, well, what would happen? Well, then your um, uh, depreciation expense wouldn't have been subtracted in the calculation of net income, right? So what do you do? You always have to add the, um, excuse me, always subtract the depreciation. So you're taking that proper subtraction for the depreciation because depreciation did not use cash and it wouldn't be included in a cash net income number. And then subtract long-term borrowing. Long-term borrowing is gonna be treated like a revenue under the cash basis. So you would of course have to subtract that to get your accrual uh, net income. Now for cash, to uh, for accrual to cash, then what? Well, now we're going to reverse the rules we saw earlier. You would start with what? Start with the accrual net income. And for current assets, do the opposite. For current liabilities, do the same. Always add depreciation, subtract fixed asset purchases, and then add long-term uh, borrowing to go from your accrual net income. Uh, to cash. So we basically just flip those rules around that we saw previously. Now, sometimes questions will tease out the components in the calculation of net income, which is what? Revenue and expenses. Now think about it. Revenue is a credit and net income is a credit, right? So if we're talking about revenue, say uh, going from cash uh, to accrual, I say follow the above rules and often they will give you accounts that are related to the calculation of revenue and you'll still follow those rules for your accounts receivable, for example, uh, your unearned revenue. And of course, cash is significant in that because they'll probably give you a cash revenue number and then you'll have to know how to convert that uh, to accrual revenue. If the problem is asking about expenses, then reverse the uh, above rules. And um, what you can do right now for that, uh, write down somewhere to make a note that um, we're going to practice with a question on that here in a minute, which is multiple 
choice question because they have questions that test these other rules as part of our material tonight, but not for this last rule. And so uh, we're going to look together at something from your homework, which is multiple choice question 05631. Okay. Now, again, I don't expect you to fully understand this and just have this whole, oh, okay, I got it. You're going to have to memorize this. You're going to have to work with it. Okay. But what I want to do is I want to practice together using these rules right now with uh, some of the information uh, that is in the textbook. Okay. So you can see that I drew, wrote in for one of the questions, one of the examples here. But let's just go back to the textbook for a second. I probably shouldn't have showed that to you yet because, well, now yeah, we're going to practice. It's okay that I showed it to you. Now, I don't care for the way Becker presented how to do this stuff. So that's why I gave you my own flashcard. You may want to look at what they're giving you. That's okay. If you like their method better, I'm not going to get my feelings hurt. I just like doing it the way I'm showing you. Okay, so I'm showing you a different alternative here. Okay, now when you look at this question, uh, they tell us that ABC company had cash collection of 50,000, made cash payments of 20,000, and recorded, here we go, cash basis net income, and they recorded cash basis net income here of 30,000. Okay, now what am I going to do? Well, the rule is that I, and um, they want me to go ahead and um, um, compute the accrual basis revenue expenses and net income. Now, I'm just going to focus, guys, on net income because we're going to look at some other problems that will deal with the revenue and expense. Let's just say this question just asked me to do the net income, okay? So what's the rule? The rule on the flashcard says that we should do what? We should, just going back to that flashcard, start with what? Start with the a cash net income. Isn't that what we're supposed to do? Okay. So the cash net income, and I'm just coming down now, was 30000 I'm just pulling that straight from the problem onto this worksheet down here on the bottom. Question so far? Okay. And then the rule is what? The rule is for current assets, do the same. And for current liabilities, do the opposite, okay? So we start to take a look. Let's go just go back to the example. And they tell us that, uh, where is it? Okay, they tell us that the accounts receivable did what? The accounts receivable increase. And so for an asset, we're supposed to do the same, aren't we? Okay, so what do we do? Since the account receivable increase, it went from 10,000 to 15,000. We're supposed to do the same. So when you go back and you look at my little worksheet here, is that what I did? I added it. Okay, then what? Then we had prepaid insurance. That is also an asset. And I'm just looking here, it must have increased. Let's just verify that. Prepaid insurance increase. We did the same. We added it, right? Okay. Then we have what? Unearned service revenue. Is that a liability? Is unearned service revenue a liability? It's a liability. It did what? It decreased. So I am supposed to do the opposite, which means I should do what? I should go ahead and I should add that. And so I go back to my little worksheet. Is that what I did? I added it, right? Okay. Then I look and we have, going back to the example in the book, they have salaries payable, salaries payable increase. So what should I do? I need to subtract it. Is that what I did here? I went ahead and I subtracted it because I want to do the opposite because the liability increased. And when we look back at the worksheet, sure enough, I did the opposite. I subtracted it. I always, what? I always have to subtract depreciation. That's probably the easiest one you'll have to deal with, right? So I subtract that. And then the purchase of equipment, the rule says, well, you have to add that back because you're treating that as an expense, okay? And when you do that, then the accrual, and I'm saying accrual revenue, and I should be more careful. Sorry, that's really the accrual what? The accrual net income. Is 72,000. 
Okay. Now, the way they did it in the book, and I just don't feel that the questions will be asked quite the way the example is showing you here, here. That's why I showed you how to start with net income. Um, you know, what they did was they converted from, you know, cash uh, revenue to accrual revenue and then from cash payments to accrual basis expenses and then took the difference to get the net income, which to me would be a very long way of doing this. Usually the question is going to start just asking you net income. And so you're better off starting with net income and going about the rules the way I put on the flashcard. Question. Again, guys, this is a lot of practice. There's a lot of practice that goes into these, okay? So having said that, let me go ahead and turn you loose now on a question, okay? And uh, they're giving us some information about what? about revenue on a cash basis and we're going to have to turn it into what uh, into a cruel basis revenue here if you need to peek at that flash card go ahead but see if you can work through this question on your own and then we'll um we'll go through it together Okay, guys, we're at about three minutes. I'm going to give you 10 more seconds. Okay, good. We were looking okay there for a while. Um, we fell below 75%, though, as I kind of started to make people nervous. I was going to 
close the question. So you might have still been working, but 67%, uh, although I like to get 75, as you know, on these is not bad for a question like this. Okay, this is kind of a hard question uh, on the exam. I would think for a question like this, you should be able to work this in about two minutes. I don't think you can work in less than that. Um, and you would have to be remembering the rules that we have on those flashcards. So since they started this, and let's just look at the question, it says that this ward uh, consulting keeps her accounting records on a cash basis. During year two, ward collected 200,000 in fees from clients. Now, when you look at that, that's telling you that that's the what? That's the cash revenue of 200,000. And we said on our flashcard that for what? For revenues, we're gonna follow the rules that we were talking about for net income, which means for what? Assets do the same, for liabilities do the opposite. Okay, so we're gonna start with that cash revenue, 200,000. And then they tell us that in December 31st, year one, Ward had accounts receivable of 40,000. And in December 31st, year two, had accounts receivable of 60,000. So we're looking at what? We're looking at an increase in accounts receivable. And the rule is that we should do the same. So we're going to do what with that? We're going to go ahead and we're going to add that uh, 20,000. And then this question gets a little bit annoying to me, guys, in that then they say in year two, uh, Ward had a counter to 60 and then and, and unearned fees of 5,000. Well, I think that's telling me that the unearned fees did what? That they went up, okay, that she had the unearned fees. That's the interpretation or the leap that you kind of have to make in this question. It's not the greatest question here in that they make you sort of make that big jump. But since it's a what? Since it's an increase in unearned revenue and unearned revenue is what? is a liability, right? So what do I do? I have to uh, do the opposite. So since it increased, I subtract it, the 5,000, and that gives me uh, the correct answer that 67% of us got, which is the 215. Now, I'd be okay with them kind of being vague about whether the unearned revenue increased or not if they hadn't what? given me this because if the unearned revenue and you made a mistake and thought that the unearned revenue did what decrease 5,000 then you might start to have a problem here but I think it's pretty fair to say well it must have been zero before and it increased right question okay let's take a look at This question, okay, so let's practice some more using those rules.
Okay, guys, I'm going to give you about five more seconds. Okay, so we struggled a little bit with this one. Um, the results here are 40%. It doesn't um, got it correct. The answer here is A, and I think um, part of the problem here is probably we're, we're still struggling with, you know, exactly um, how to um, use those rules. And when you're dealing with net income and you're dealing with revenues, you get those rules in your mind. And then it starts to get a little bit hard to realize that um, for the um, for you, you get all hopped up in doing the cash to accrual, and then you have to switch gears. In this question, we had to go from what? From accrual to cash. And then it's going to get a little tougher here in a, in a second. We're going to look at another question where you're gonna to have to sit there and start getting used to well, what do you do if we're talking about expenses versus revenue. So, but let's just go ahead and work this one together. So they gave me the accrual net income, okay? And so we're supposed to what? Start with the accrual income of 100,000. And let's just peek back at the flashcard one more time. Let's make sure that the flashcard is telling us what we're supposed to do here, which is what? Accrual to cash, start with net income. For current assets, do the opposite. For liabilities, do the same. Always add depreciation, subtract fixed assets, purchases, and add long-term uh, borrowing to go from accrual to cash, which is what we're doing this question. In other words, reverse what you would have done if you're going from cash to accrual. Um, you see how it's kind of hard to kind of hold all that in your head, but that's your job. I mean, you're going to have to get used to that and practice with that, just like it's hard to do certain dances sometimes, right? Okay, so you come over and when we look back at that uh, question, okay, what happens? You look and they say at the end of the uh, year, accounts receivable increased by 10,000. Well, what's happening? Since we're going from accrual to cash, we would sit there and say, well, since the accounts receivable increased, the increase in accounts receivable, we're supposed to do what? We're supposed to do the opposite now, not the same. We do the opposite because we're going from accrual to cash. And then the accounts payable decreased. Okay, so decrease in accounts payable now. And for liabilities, we're supposed to do what? Do the same. And so you would subtract that. And when you do the math on that, you get the correct answer here, the 84,000, that's the cash income. Okay. So again, guys, way to attack this stuff is look at those flashcards apply those rules, keep practicing with those rules and you get sharper and sharper and better and better at this. You should be able to start working these questions by the, by the time you're on your exam, you should be able to work a question like this in about two minutes. Okay. Okay, the reason I'm not showing you the way Becker's doing it is I just think on the exam, that's gonna take too much time to do them like that um, and the way they uh, decide to do it. So even, when you look at um, some of the uh, multiple choice questions in your homework, um, like that one that I wrote down there, 05631, let me show you the solution. Follow the rules the way I'm talking about them here. I think you're gonna be much better off. Question. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and stop there on this topic. Uh, you see that question, I want you to practice this rule on expenses. I'm gonna go ahead and decide that I think uh, it's better at this point if we move forward and um, take a look at this next module, which is ratio analysis. And I have um, asked you to flashcard and memorize every single ratio 
and they give you a balance sheet and an income statement, and then they show you how to calculate those ratios. Okay, so you do need to be good at that. That is a potential five to 10 point area on the exam. You could very likely see a task-based simulation, which they're asking you to calculate some of these ratio and also uh, describe what the ratio is indicating. When I say describe, there won't be a written communication on your FAR exam, that's only on the BEC, but they may have you know, a set of different um, in, you know, uh, conclusions that can be drawn by the ratios that they ask you to calculate and ask you to select the correct one, either in a multiple choice question or in a task-based simulation, maybe where they're asking you to match up the correct conclusion with whatever happened with the ratio, okay? So you need to be good at that. Okay, so what I wanna do now is turn our attention to partnerships. And I don't know why for some time there was a rumor going around that partnerships were gonna be removed from the exam. And I don't know where that came from. So if you hear anything like that, that is not correct. Partnership accounting is still a, a relevant topic uh, for the CPA exam, okay? So, we're going to take a look at these and um, what we're going to see is there's going to be three different methods that we're going to have to know how to use for the admission of a partner and the um, withdrawal of a partner okay for the admission of a partner we can use the exact method we could use the goodwill method we could use the bonus method okay typically on the exam when they're asking about the um, withdrawal of a partner, the exit of a partner, it's usually either the bonus or the goodwill method uh, that they talk about at that point, because there'd really be nothing interesting about the exact method, because they'd simply you'd be giving that partner whatever's in their equity account as they leave, and there's no calculation to that, okay? So let's just go ahead and take a look at the three methods. And when I look at these questions, guys, they come down to just algebraic and manipulation of the information that's in the question. And I think what you'll find is you will get good at this. You will have a time saver for yourself on the exam because examiners are thinking these questions will probably take you a little longer than you're gonna take once you get comfortable with how to look at these. And I think in some cases you might find these to be kind of fun um, you know, word problems essentially, okay? So when we take a look, the three methods are going to be the exact method, the um, the bonus method and the goodwill method, okay? Now, with the exact method, okay, and I'm going to actually ask you to flashcard a pass key down here. Finally, they gave us a pass key that I think is worthwhile. The problem will ask you, how much should the new partner contribute? So they're not going to say, hey, um, don't use goodwill, don't use bonus, or they're not gonna say use, good, uh, use the exact method. They are simply going to ask you how much the new partner has to contribute to get an X percent interest, okay? And they are not even gonna mention goodwill or bonus. So when you see that, flashcard that, that means you're using the exact method, okay? So you look at this example, this question, let's just look at the example. And we have A, B, and C are partners in a three-person partnership, and they have capital accounts of 20, 30, and 50,000 respectively. A, B, and C decide to admit D as a new partner with a 25% interest, and they wanna know how much D should contribute to get that 25% interest. So you just start doing the algebra on that, guys. You say, well, A, amount plus B partner's amount plus C partner's amount and partner D's contribution, that's the unknown, isn't it? Okay. Now they go ahead and they add A, B, and C up. That comes to a total of 100,000. And then they turn D into what? Well, D after their contribution should end up with what? 0.25 of the new equity, shouldn't they? Okay. Now all they do is they subtract Okay, so you can almost put an equal sign between here and here, right? All they do is they subtract 0.25 of new equity from each side. And so now what? Now 100,000 is equal to what? 
2.75 of the total new equity. So they simply did what? They simply subtracted 0.75 from both, I mean, excuse me, 0.25 from each side. Okay. Then they go ahead and they continue with the algebra. They simply divide both sides by 0.75. That then gives them what? The new equity. And what happens if the new partner is going to end up with 0.25 of the total new equity? That means they would contribute 3,333 $3, $3, $3, $3, $3, $3, $3, $3, to get a 25% interest. Okay. Okay. So if they don't tell you use the bonus method, they, or they, they, they won't mention the bonus method or the uh, goodwill method. So don't kill yourself looking for that. If they ask you what is the new partner's amount that they have to contribute, that means use the exact method. To me, that's the most important thing to remember. Okay. Now, when you get to the bonus method or the uh, goodwill method, the problem will tell you. They will say, use goodwill use bonus or they will they will they will have okay back up john slow down they will have to tell you the amount that the new partner is bringing in if they tell you the amount the new partner is bringing in now your question is use bonus or use goodwill and then they're either going to have to tell you use bonus use goodwill or they'll say they decided not to use bonus and you're not left you're not left with anything but what goodwill or they'll say don't use goodwill then you're left with what bonus okay but they will tell you the amount that's going to be contributed and then they will either instruct you what method to use or they will tell you don't use the bonus that means goodwill or they'll say don't use goodwill that means what use the bonus method okay so let's just go ahead and let's take a look at this example and they tell us that abc share profits and losses 60 40 and that's before the new partner comes along and they have capital accounts of 30,000 that's 30,000 for partner a and that's 30 uh, 10,000 excuse me for partner b now i'm going to go ahead and i'm going to just set up partner a's t account for their equity partner a okay and i want to set up set up their t account and you'll see why here in a couple of seconds okay and um c has agreed to invest thirty five thousand. now if they tell me that i know i've got I'm going to either have to use bonus or goodwill this is not the exact method right and it's going to yield partner c a thirty five thousand per um, one third interest in the new abc partnership since the partnership has decided not to recognize goodwill, okay? And that's where the question would probably stop. And they could ask you a variety of questions. For example, they typically like to pick one of the existing partners and ask you what their equity account will look like at the end of the, uh, after the new partner is ad admitted, say partner A. So the way I set these up, and the reason I'm not reading further, guys, is they kind of ask you for the journal entry, and they continue to give you how to solve the problem. And I'm thinking more likely the question, we can look at the journal entry, but more likely the question will just ask you, you know, what's in going to be an A or B's capital count after the contribution comes in. And um, they, since they said, don't use goodwill, we have to use the bonus method. Okay, so to use the bonus method to do the algebra, we have what? We have 30,000, that's partner A. We have what? We have 10,000, that's partner B. Okay, and we have what? We have the new partner C, who we know is going to give what? Is going to give 35,000, right? So the new equity, the equity of the new partnership after everybody's in, is going to be what uh, seventy five thousand, and that seventy five thousand is going to yield C a what a one third interest. So if we divide that by three, that means that what C is going to get something worth twenty five thousand, but they're paying what 
35,000. So if the question were to ask you, what's the bonus? You would simply say, okay, 35,000 is what he paid in. He got what? He got 25,000 worth of equity. So he paid into the new partners a bonus of what? Of 10,000. So if the question just asks you the bonus, fine. But sometimes they want to go a little further and ask you, well, what would be the amount of the bonus that would go to say partner A? Well, you can see up here, since partner A gets what? 60% uh, of profit and losses and partner B gets what? Gets 40% uh, then what? Then partner A gets 6,000 of that and partner B gets 4,000 of that $10,000 bonus, right? Or the question could say, what will be, and they'll pick one of the partners, let's say they said, what will be in partner A's equity account after the admission of the new partner using the bonus method or not using goodwill? So there's nothing left there. With bonus, the answer would be 36,000, right? Okay. Okay, good. Now you come over and they could ask you what? They could ask you the goodwill method. And what I like about the goodwill method, and again, uh, to calculate the goodwill, they'd be telling you what the new partner is going to bring in and they'll say, don't use bonus or they'll say, use goodwill. Okay, so if that's the case, if we're using the goodwill method and you may see, back-to-back -back problems on your exam uh, in multiple choice question format in which they'll sit there and they'll literally give you the same facts and they'll simply uh, ask you to um, use the bonus method for one, the goodwill method for the other. So that's sort of what we did here. They're telling us, again, as we've seen, A, B, share profit 60, 40. A has a capital count of 30. B has a capital count of 10. Um, C has invested 35,000 for a one third interest, but now they tell us, yeah, recognize goodwill on this, okay? So when you look at the solution here, guys, and I think that um, the solution is actually helpful here, the way they laid it out to us, the implied value of the company is what? Is 105,000. If they're paying 35,000 for a one third interest, the new partner is, that means the punk company must be worth what? 105. But the actual contributed capital that we're looking at here is 35 for C. We kind of make the order here a little confusing 10,000 for B and 30,000 for A. That's a total of 75,000 that's been invested. So that difference is what is goodwill, okay? And so we bring in the cash of 35,000, right? We take the what? We take the goodwill and we literally record the goodwill of 30,000. And then we distribute that goodwill to the two respective existing partners. The idea being that they're the ones that created the goodwill that this guy's willing to pay, um, you know, this 35,000. Meanwhile, there's only 75,000 of equity in here. That goodwill must be accrued to the existing partners. And then you just bring in a C for whatever it is that they contributed. Question. Okay, good. So let's go ahead. And I don't think you need that pass key because again, exact method, they'll tell you the amount of the, con uh, they'll ask you what is the contribution of the new partner. The other methods, they'll do what? They'll give you the amount of the contribution of the new partner and then they'll instruct you what method to use. They'll give you information so you can figure out what method to use. Okay. All right, let's go ahead then and let's take a look at these couple of partnership questions.
Okay, guys, we're coming up on we're up on three minutes. So I'm going to go ahead and end the poll. Uh, a question like this should probably take you less than two minutes uh, when you're on the exam. Uh, but let's go ahead and let's take a look. And um, the correct answer I probably should have shared the results a little bit longer is five thousand. It looks I forget most of us got it right. I forgot. I forgot to look at the percentage there. But let's just go ahead and let's take a look at this question. And they're telling us what well, that we are to use the bonus method uh, and they want the total bonus. Now they could ask for a bonus to the partners respectively. And when they do, which partner, they'll probably pick one of the partners. When they do that, uh, then they tend to uh, give you the profit and loss sharing uh, percentages, which they did not do here, okay? But that, that wasn't necessary because they just asked the total bonus. So what happens if we have one partner has a capital account of 45,000, the other has um, 25,000, and the new person, I guess Rob here, is going to be giving 30,000, then the total new equity is going to be what? 100,000. And we can see that what? That's going to buy uh, the new partner what? 25%. Okay, when he gives that investment. So 25% of 100,000 is easy enough to, then I can calculate that in my head. That's what? $25,000. And so the bonus is going to be what? Is going to be 5,000 that would then be distributed. And again, in order for us to see how much Eagle or Falk get, they'd have to tell us what the profit and loss sharing percentage was here, but they didn't go that far with that question. So they just asked the total bonus. Okay. Okay, good. And notice, as I mentioned, and you may see this approach on your exam. My guess is that these questions were released by the CPA exam sometime back. Um, this is how they do it, guys. They'll ask you the same fact pattern, but then they'll ask you to use goodwill. So let's go ahead and uh, let's take a look at this one now using the goodwill method. Okay, guys, we're up on two minutes. I'm going to give you 10 more seconds.
Okay, so that was about two minutes and 20 seconds that we spent on that question. And um, I'm going to go ahead and end the poll. And um, share the results with you. And okay, good. Looks like we're starting to get comfortable with these partnership questions. What well, last time we, I don't know what the percentage was, but this time we're at 85% correct. Uh, and that most of us got this right. Now let's just go ahead and work with this. And, um, you know, a couple of us, one of us anyway, chose B. Guys, if they give you back-to-back -back questions like this, there's no way they both have the same right answer. Different method, different answer, okay? So if you chose B for the first one, don't choose B for the second one. You know, if you're guessing, choose another number, okay? But let's just go ahead and let's take a look at this one, okay? And um, when we look at it, they have the same fact pattern. So remember the 45,000 plus the 25,000 plus the 30,000 equaled up to what? Equaled up to 100,000. Okay. But under the goodwill method, they're sitting there and saying, well, look, if this dude is paying, to, I don't know if it's a dude or what, but this person is paying 25%, uh, 30,000 for 25%, then the company must be worth what? The company must be worth four times that, right? 30,000 times what? Times the uh, four, or you could say 30,000 divided by 0.25, same outcome, which is what? which is this 120,000, but there's only been contributed capital of what? Of 100,000 in here? So there's a bonus here. I mean, not that, that. there's goodwill here of what? Of 20,000, right? Okay, all right, not the toughest area, guys. You will get very good at this, I promise you. This will be, you know, set of easy, points for you probably in a multiple choice question. Now, income loss, just income or loss distribution, um, basically follow the directions. The question will tell you, this is how they're going to distribute profit and losses. And you will simply do whatever the question tells you to do to figure out how much of the profit or loss should go. So it's really a um, reading comprehension question, okay? So when you look at this example, they tell us, let's just look at an example here, A, B, and C have capital counts at the end of the year before any profit or loss distributions, 30, 60, and 90 respectively. The partnership profit for the year, excluding any payments to partner was 200,000. Okay, so we got 200,000. How are we gonna distribute that? And then the question starts telling me, the partnership agreement provides for interest of 8% on ending capital balances, a salary to A of 10,000 and a bonus to C of 15% of partnership profits before any distribution to partners. The profit and loss ratios then after we distribute would be what 20% to A, 30% to B and 50% to C. So you start to take a look at this and we follow the directions. There's 200,000, but there's what? A 15% guaranteed bonus that automatically has to go to C. So C is getting 30,000 of that 200,000. There is a 8% uh, interest on the capital balances. And so you take a look and I'm not gonna do every single one of these guys, but if you look at, uh, Let's just pick, for example, this is A, this is B, this is C up here. So let's just look at B, okay? 8% times what? Times the 60,000 that he had in his, he or she had in the account there, 8% of 60,000 gives me for B, what? 4,800 and so on. They'll do that for each partner. I'm not gonna do every single one of them. 48% of 90,000 is 7,200, right? they would go over to C and so on, okay? So now 
we've got some of that 200,000 going out that way. And then they told us we have to pay what? A salary to A, so that goes into A's account. And then we have what? This remaining 145,000 that's left of which the problem told me of the 145,000, say 50%, for example, or 72.8 goes to C, 30% goes to B and 20% goes to A. And then the question might ask you, what is the capital balance after, in one of the partner's accounts after you do all this? Following directions. We just did what the problem told us to do. And then we look at this and people, you know, that are not accountants think, wow, that was really complicated. This is what accountants, you'd probably do stuff like this for fun sometimes in your head when you're sitting there and you're thinking, well, what would happen if I had to distribute da, 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 da? And you start thinking about that kind of stuff, right? Um, when my dad was getting older, um, he had, um, you know, given his kids some money over his lifetime. And then he asked me to sit there and say, well, look, here's what I've given to the respective kids so far, back that out. And then what's left will go 25% for each kid. So I sat there and I went through that whole process with them. Okay, here's the numbers to today. And when he passed, and I always told him, I am going to follow those directions. I told everybody, I am doing what it says in the trust. And that's exactly, uh, when he passed, that's exactly how we did things. So sometimes it could be in that context too. Okay. All right, good. Let's go ahead and let's take a look at question. The next one, question three, I guess here. Okay, we're a little over two minutes. I'll give you 10 more seconds. Okay, good. Let's go ahead and let's take a look at this one. And uh, good, we've got a 73% on this. I'd say this is a problem that, you know, um, you might need to 
practice with a little bit to be able to get it right. But most of us, 73% uh, of us got it correct, okay? But let's just take a look at it. And again, we would follow the directions here in which they tell us that young and zinc, okay, have an average capital balance of 160,000, that's for young, Y-O-U-N-G, 160,000 for young and 100,000 for zinc, okay? And then um, they say that they each receive a 10% interest on capital balances and residual profit losses divided equally and the profit before the distribution was 4,000, okay? But we are saying that what? Young got to get 10% and Zinc got to get what? Their 10% first. So that means that Young is entitled to 16,000 and Zinc is entitled to what? 10,000. So that means when you consider those distributions, we are using up all the profit and then some, right? So it's 4,000 minus 26,000 means we got a negative, what? 22,000 that then is going to be distributed evenly, 50-50. So that means that what? 11,000 got to come out of young and 11,000 got to come out of zinc. And so at the end of all this, what happens? Young, although the question didn't ask us this, would be up 5,000 and zinc would be what? Down 1,000, which was the uh, question asked about zinc, which was the correct answer that you saw there. Okay, reading comprehension, guys. You're going to get better and better at this as you practice more and more with these questions. Practice is key to these kind of questions. Okay. Okay, good. Let's go ahead and look at withdrawal of a partner. And when we look at withdrawal of a partner, we could do it under the bonus or the goodwill uh, method. Okay, now, uh, just as when we admitted the partners, right? Um, they don't ask for the exact method for withdrawal because the exact method would be what is ever in their capital account, that's what they're gonna get when they withdraw, okay? So typically with withdrawal of a partner, they ask bonus or goodwill, okay? Now the difference between the balance of the drawing partner's capital balance and the amount that person is paid is the amount of the bonus in these situations, okay? So the question might ask you, what's the bonus or how much is gonna be paid out to withdraw this person out, et cetera, okay? Now, um, in this example that I'm going to give you, I'm going to tell you that the assets fair value is 100,000 and um, well, the assets, I want to do this away, the assets fair value is, how do I want to write this? Why don't I just write it the way I wrote it? Assets fair market value Just write it out, John. I'm trying to figure out how to use the greater than or equal to sign and that's not working out in my head right now. The assets fair market value are one hundred thousand dollars more. than book value. And students always get confused. So where'd you get that? I made it up. I had a nightmare last night and an evil monster came to me and told me that this is what I'm gonna do with this question. I'm just making it up, okay? So if that's the case, and guys, I'm gonna get rid of these X's and actually put numbers here, okay? Then that means I have to write the assets up to 100,000 because when the old partner is leaving, we're essentially creating a new partnership. So we have to write the assets up to whatever that new fair market value is. Now, again, as part of my nightmare last night, I decided that A has a capital balance of 40%, B has a capital balance of 40%, 
and X has a capital balance of 20%. So to distribute that 100,000, what happens? Well, that means that what? A will get 40,000 of that. B will get 40,000 of that. And X will get what? 20,000 of that. Now, as part of my made up situation, okay, I just decided that partner X before the write up had 30,000 in there. Before the write up, partner X had 30,000. And we just did what? We just credited 20,000. Okay, so they've got what? They've got 50,000 sitting there, don't they? Okay, now let's say they decide, and again, and I know this is hard sometimes, where are you getting all these numbers, John? From here. Let's just pretend that they decided, hey, we're gonna, this guy is getting ready to retire. He got 50,000. You know, let's give him a $10,000 bonus. He was always a nice guy. Okay, so what are they gonna do? Well, they're going to sit there, and if they take that $10,000 bonus, it's got to come out of the guys that are staying in there. And so partner A constitutes what? 40% of the 80% between those two, as does what? As does partner B. Okay, so I'm using the 80% that they held and the 10,000 bonus is gonna come out of them. And so half is going to come out of what? Come out of the capital account of A. Half is going to come out of the uh, capital account of B. They're going to liquidate partner X now. Well, partner X got what? He got 50,000, so to zero him out, we got to debit him 50,000, don't we? And since they're giving him 10,000 more, his 50,000 plus the 10,000 bonus means they're going to cut him a check for $60,000, aren't they? Okay. So the the to me the reason it's worth putting some numbers on this, the way they did this, is this part right here. I mean, that's the part that when students look at questions in the homework, they're like, what the, where did that come from? They're saying, hey, of the 80% of the people that are paying out the partner, that's how it goes. And it doesn't always have to be 50, 50. It could be, you know, 60, 40, whatever. Or, you know, you know what I mean? It could be, 50, 30, and you'd make the calculation that way, and so on. Okay, okay, good. Now, if it's goodwill method, okay, again, no difference. You have to always write up the assets. So that's gonna be the write-up of the 100,000, and I'm, again, assuming 40%, 40%, 20%. There's no difference. 40,000 goes here. 40,000 goes here and 20,000 goes here. And again, um, you know, partner X, I'm assuming. Had 30,000. Okay. And we just wrote them up. What? Just wrote them up. Um, 20,000. Right, so now he's got what? Now he's got 50,000 in there, okay? And so with the 50,000 that he has in his account right now, okay? That's equivalent to saying that the company is worth what? 50,000 divided by 0.2 is equivalent to saying that the company's worth what? is worth uh, 250,000. Okay. But remember, they want to pay him what? They want to pay him a bonus of 10,000. 
So if it's 50,000 plus what? Plus the 10,000, that's sort of like saying that the company is worth what? 60,000, isn't it? Okay, since they're going to pay them out 60,000 and that 60,000, I mean, not saying the company's worth 60,000, that's saying the company is worth what? 20% of 60,000. So if you divide each side by 0.2, now you're saying that the company is worth what? 300,000. Well, that difference between what was in the capital count versus what you're gonna end up cashing them out for, that difference of 250,000 versus 300,000 is what? Is a $50,000 difference. That 50,000 is goodwill. So now we go ahead and we debit the goodwill for 50,000, right? And then we use the appropriate 40% um, of the 50,000 goes to partner A for 20,000. 40% goes to what? Uh, partner B for 20,000 and 20% of the goodwill goes to partner X or what? 10,000. So when you add that 10,000 to partner X's account, the person who's leaving, they got 60,000 in there, don't they? And so then when you go ahead and you cash them out, you debit their capital account for 60,000 and you credit the cash. Okay. So again, I go ahead and I put these numbers on here, guys, and I made this up because I don't see there's any freaking way you'd understand what was going on here without a set of numbers. Um, so that's sort of how that would work. Question? Okay, good. Um, liquidation of a partnership, okay? And this means everybody's leaving, okay? And if it's a liquidation of a partnership, flash card that creditors get paid first, okay? And then you have to remember to convert non-cash assets to cash. So you're gonna sell everything in this liquidation and then you're going to distribute the cash. So first you got to what? First you got to pay any creditors. Well, you sell everything. Then you first pay creditors. If there's amounts that are outstanding to partners, maybe the partners have made some loans, they're like a creditor. You got to pay them out. If there's any instructions as to who gets some certain amount distributed first, pay them out. And then the remaining what will be distributed based on the profit and loss. Um, sharing agreement, whatever it is, okay? Okay, and I'll let you look at uh, this uh, example here, um, sort of on your own. Um, they have these different account balances here. And let's just look at an assumption one, okay? And then I'll let you look at some of these other on, others on your own. But we have cash balance, non-cash assets. They sell the non-cash assets uh, for 75,000. So now they've got what? They, um, excuse me, they sell them for 125,000. They were at 75,000, they sell them for 125. So now we have what? We have 145,000. The first thing you do is you pay off your creditors. Okay, now there's what, $120,000 balance left. And then the problem said, well, there were some amounts that were owned to partners B and C. So you pay them out. And then the 100,000 that's left is paid out in this example based on the relative um, distribution uh, to each of the uh, partners. Now I got a problem. Why are they distributing? Does that come out to? Shouldn't A be getting 50,000 in this example? 
what happened. I always hated this example. I'm not sure where they, I got to be honest, I'm not sure where they're getting those distributions. Why is it not 50, 30, and 20? Is there something up in here that they told us? Well, this is a good point for a break, so you don't have to sit here and watch me stare at this. And then when we come back, I'll take a look at it and see what I figure out. So let's just take a break uh, right now, and um, we'll come back, and I'll address this question in about 10 minutes. And so we'll come back at, um, <sighs> what time is it here? We'll come back at, let's just make it, uh, let's just make it uh, 6.55, okay? We'll come back and uh, we'll look at this and then we'll get into chapter three. So if you wanna grab the chapter three, you can at this point um, for 4.2, which I have posted up on e-learning, okay? All right, guys, we'll be right back. Uh, professor? Yes. Um... I, I just had a thought for when it's a liquidation, don't the partners only get up to the amount of their capital account balance? Is that what's going on here? Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. So I shouldn't have used, thank you. I don't know. Who was that? Uh, Michael. Michael. Yeah, I see. Yeah. How could they get more than what was in their account balances? That was right. So the 50, 30, and 20 were relevant for the gain on the sale of the asset, right? Yeah. So since they gained 50,000 on the um, sale of the non-cash assets, that's why A got 25, B got 15, and uh, C got 10. Yeah, thank you. Because they wouldn't be able to get more than what they had, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, that was tripping me out at first. I'm like, why is it? Yeah. Fifty percent, but yeah, that then I, because I took um the advanced financial accounting uh during the spring term, so I just went through all this. Just yeah, this, and know? sometimes I just you know I look at so much stuff and trying to work these questions for you that sometimes I lose the obvious. So, right. um, so thank <laughs> you. Yeah, stuff. Thank you for saving me that. Now I can actually have a real break. <laughs> then we come back because some of the fast money jumped out. We'll explain it to you. I'll let I'll let you explain it. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. Appreciate yeah. it. Thank you. Yep. Okay, guys, we're gonna get started back. I went ahead and uh, <clears throat> resumed the recording. And um, I don't know if some of you had heard there at the end of the um, just as we went to the break, Michael helped me out to figure out what was going on here. So I'm going to let Michael sort of explain um, what I couldn't figure out. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I remembered from my advanced financial accounting that uh, when a partnership is liquidated, the partners are entitled only to the amount of their capital balances. That's why the last distribution of cash is only isn't equal to you know their profit sharing of 50 30 20 that only applies to any gain or losses and there was a gain of 50,000 when they sold the uh, non-cash assets for cash yeah that did follow the distributions right but uh, once that happened, then that became irrelevant for the calculation of what each person would get. It was just based on what was left in their accounts. Thank you. Okay, good, good work. So with all that, I think we've put enough uh, effort into chapter two. So I'm going to try to close that out.
Someone's going to start this nonsense with me. Don't have any inking in progress. I don't know what its problem is. So let's see if it'll just let me go over to, okay, it ended up crashing the whole thing. Wonderful. So let me just come back. A little bit ponderous here. Discard. Don't want to recover anything. I'll just let me open it. File open. And <laughs> okay. Open and it's gonna make me do it this way. Or two. Okay. Okay, good. So let's go ahead and let's take a look at uh, the uh, chapter three now. And, you know, we kind of hovered around the income statement here through a lot of this discussion. As I said, chapter two was sort of a catch all. Now we're going to turn our attention to the balance sheet. And that's really going to be the case through F3, F4. We'll get into consolidations because we're going to be talking about accounting for investments. So it makes sense to talk about consolidation there. F5, liabilities. F6, continue on with liabilities. F7, stockholders, equity. And it's not until F8 that we get to the statement of cash flow. So we're kind of you know, departing from the revenue recognition income statement related type topics. And we're now going to turn our attention to the balance sheet. And you can see that we literally walk our way through the balance sheet in order of liquidity of the assets here, right? So we talk about cash and cash equivalents, and that's about a five point area on the exam. When we talk about trade receivables, trade receivables in and of themselves, notes, um, notes receivable tends to be about 10 points. Accounts receivable um, tends to be about five points. Okay, I'll put the point value first, We're consistent here. Tends to be about five points, notes receivable, accounts receivable. Um, but what tends to be the heavier area here is the allowance. The examiners like to spend a lot of time asking you, a lot of point value asking you about the allowance because they figure you probably forgot your allowance accounting. So we're gonna review some of that and we're gonna be in pretty good shape there. Inventory has long been a heavy area on the exam about 10 points, okay? Property, plant, and equipment, eh, five points. Depreciation methods, five points. They don't get too, too heavily in that. That's pretty easy. Non-monetary transactions, okay? What happens if we exchange, say, equipment for equipment? About five points. Intangibles, maybe about five points. And then dealing with impairment, probably not as heavy, about two points. Of course, you need to spend the requisite time going through all the material for all of these. Don't think that any of this is an indication to you of things you don't have to look at. I'm just giving you some senses to the relative weight of where you're going to see some of these topics when you get on your exam, but you need to spend the time with all of these. Okay. Okay, good. Now we come over and we start talking about cash and cash equivalents. Okay. And basically, I think you know by now, if you got this far, the cash, let me change my view to full screen, the cash is what? currency, whether it's in the account or on hand, okay? All of these things are considered cash, okay? Deposits held as compensating balances against borrowing with a lending institution that are not legally restricted, okay? Now, if they are legally restricted, then they are not considered cash, okay? So that's a good flashcard right there. If there's a legal restriction, meaning that you don't have access to those funds, 
then it's not considered a cash or cash equivalent. It's going to be some uh, asset that is restricted, okay? And you're not going to list it as cash. Um, now, what is legally restricted? Well, if they say, hey, we're loaning you a million dollars, but you have to keep 200,000 on balance at all times, and that's part of the agreement, then that's not even considered cash. Sometimes they'll write that up, but they'll say, if the balance falls below 200,000, we're loaning you a million dollars. And if you have to leave 200,000 on balance with us, but if it falls below 200,000, then the interest rate on your loan is going to change. Well, that's not a legal restriction on that. So that would still be considered a cash equivalent. Cash, cash equivalent. Now, the more interesting discussion here really is, well, what do we mean by cash equivalents, okay? And so we come down and when we talk about cash equivalents, we're talking about commercial paper, treasury bills, having an original maturity. And when we say original maturity to purchaser, of, well, I don't have to write the 90 days or less because that's there of 90 days or less. Okay, that is considered a cash equivalent. Okay, now these same items, they call out uh, uh, CDs here, if original purchaser, if original maturity to purchaser is over 90 days, then it's not a cash equivalent. And this also applies to T-bills. I don't know why they weren't consistent in writing T-bills down here as well, okay? Now flashcard that rule. If the original maturity to purchaser is uh, 90 days or less, it's a cash equivalent. So when you calculate your change in cash, for example, on the statement of cash flows, you treat that as though it was cash. If it had an original, uh, um, Per original maturity to the purchaser of 90 days or less. Okay. Now let's just come down and I'm going to co opt this space at the bottom though and give you an example here because I know that can be a little bit unclear without an actual example. Okay. So let's say we have two T bills. Okay. We have T bill and T bill one and T-bill two. So we have these two T-bills. T-bill one is purchased, eh, I guess it's easier to write it like this for you. T-bill T is a treasury bill, right? Okay. T-bill one, T-bill two. T-bill one is purchased, I gotta write that over. And let's say it's purchased one, one, 21. And let's say it matures on one, one, 22. Okay. Now T bill two is purchased on 12, one, 21 and matures, okay, two different T-bills, I have to write purchase and mature again, and matures on one, one, um, 22. Okay, and so I'm gonna ask you the question, cash EQ. So yes or no, is T-bill one a cash equivalent? What do you think? Anybody? Sorry, did you ask T-bill one or T-bill two? T-bill one, is it a yeah. cash equivalent? No. No. No, because it didn't have an original maturity to the purchaser of what? Of less than 90 days, it's one year. How about T-bill two? Yes. T-bill two, yes, we're what, we're 30 days, aren't we? Okay, now guys, these T-bills may be the same Q-SIP. Q-SIP is how they identify each T-bill. 
So they may be the same QCIP. They may have been auctioned off on the same day, but company didn't get around to purchasing on the secondary market T-bill two until the end of the year. That would be a cash equivalent of 1231 financial statements, whereas T-bill one, since they purchased it probably when it was issued, um, then it is not a cash equivalent. Question? Okay, good. Now you come over and they tell us that cash, okay, cash is classified as restricted or unrestricted, okay? Now, if it is unrestricted, if it is unrestricted, it is a current asset. If it is unrestricted, it is a current asset. You don't have to ask yourself another question. It is a current asset if it's unrestricted. Okay. If the cash is what? Cash is restricted. Okay. For restricted cash, and the rule is down here, if the restriction is associated with a current asset or current liability, so we're putting aside a cash to pay off a large payable or something, uh, account payable, uh, then it is considered current. If the restriction is associated with a long-term purpose, such as we're setting it aside to purchase, say, a long-term item, a piece of equipment or something, then the cash is considered non-current. So you can flashcard that rule. I don't know that you need to flashcard the rule about unrestricted cash being current automatically. That's probably easy enough to remember, okay? Now, how we classify assets as current or non-current really frequently has a lot to do with the company's intent, okay? So what is the company's intent? So you can often look to that to see as to whether or not you would classify something as current or non-current. Question? Okay, good. Now you come over and you take a look at um, this example of items to include in cash. And I don't know, I think this is a little bit uh, mislabeled because to me, this is more of a timing exercise than it is what is a cash or cash equivalent, which is what you would think when you're reading through this, okay, initially, or when you look at this title, okay. But what happens? They tell us that in December 31st, year seven, they had 160,000. And then they give us these things and see if we know how to adjust this cash balance based on the timing of when these things hit into our bank account. And um, it really is more of a timing exercise than anything. So there's a $5,000 check payable to Smith dated January 2nd, year eight and is not included in the December 31st checkbook balance. Well, that's fine, it shouldn't be. The check is dated after the end of year seven, so it's not part of the year seven cash balance. And since it's not included, that's a good thing. So we just ignore that. I'm putting that I beam there because I don't care. Fine. Now I look at this next one and it tells me a $35,000 check payable to Smith deposited December 22nd and included in December 31st. Did I start the recording again? Yeah, I did, okay. A $3,000 check payable to Smith deposited December 22nd and included in the December 31st checkbook balance was returned non-sufficient funds, it bounced. The check was redeposited and cleared uh, on, uh, in year eight on January 7th. Well, that should only be included in what? In the year eight cash balance, not the year seven cash balance. So they got to take that $3,500 and they got to do what? Subtract it, okay? And then they tell us that there's a $25,000 check payable to a supplier drawn on Smith's account it was dated, but they didn't mail it until January 8th. Well, we got to look to when it was in the mail. And so we add that back because it shouldn't be subtracted for our cash balance until year eight. Okay, 
Okay, that's why you see to me that's more of a cash, a, a timing exercise than what we just did up here as to whether sums of cash or cash equivalent. We will look at a class question in a minute that tests that concept. Okay, bank reconciliation, guys. I'm not going to spend a lot of time with this. I think that, um, you know, if you got this far in accounting life, you know how to reconcile a bank account. Okay, so all you need to kind of review on your own, I'm going to let you do this on your own, guys. I'm going to just put down here review for homework. I do want you to look at this, but I don't think it is worth our time together to sit here and for me to walk you through a simple bank reconciliation. Okay, unless somebody insists. Okay, I don't think it's necessary. So I want to turn our attention now to, and don't worry about four column bank reconciliation, but I do want you to look at this question now. <clears throat> okay, guys, that's about two minutes on that question, so I'm going to go ahead and end the poll and uh, share the results with you here. And okay, I don't think that uh, we should have got a better percentage on that one. Um, please don't guess on these questions, guys. I mean, you know, you might be working through these uh, carefully, right? So uh, you take a look and um, let's just go through this one together. And obviously the check, I mean, the, the, the exam, didn't even challenge us on whether those two things, because that's totaling up to 600,000, right? You can get any of the answers without those two, okay? Then what? Then they really are focusing the, you know, analysis, if you will, here on the T-bills and notice that one is purchased on 12-1, year two, it matures in 228, year three. We're right there on the nine, on the 90 days, aren't we? So we would go ahead and include that 800,000. The one that is what purchase three, one year two is not maturing until year three. No, we're not including that because that's past the 90 days, right? Okay. And so we go ahead and notice they're talking about when it's purchased. Okay. And I see they finally fixed that. I used to whine about that, that they were calling that a T bill. It's a bond when it uh, goes past 
when it has a maturity of a year or longer, it's actually a bond. Okay, so we go ahead and we add all that up and that's how they got the 1,400,000. Okay, all right guys, don't guess. I mean, there's a question on the concept, I'm all ears, but um, I don't want you to guess. Okay, all right, good. Let's see, I think we can get through module two, okay. Let me see something, let me just take a quick look here forward. I should have stayed in full screen. Yeah, let's see if we can work our three through module two. I don't think we'll get into module three because I don't like to start a module and not be able to finish it. But I think we have sufficient time to get us uh, properly through module two. And then you can finish up for your homework chapter two and the first two modules of chapter three okay all right good now we start out with the discussion of the blank account analysis format and we're talking about it in the context of receivables and we're going to talk about it in the context of um, the allowance for doubtful accounts okay but i want you to realize that you can use this for any account it's not limited to receivable, it's not limited to allowances, okay? On the CPA exam, they typically don't ask you the ending balance for something, because that's too easy, because you just analyze the transaction, you can almost use a T account for that, right? What they tend to like to do is ask you, well, what was added to the account for the period? What was subtracted? What was the beginning balance? That's a little more challenging for you on the exam, and God did not make T accounts to tell you what the beginning balance was. You have a beginning balance and you make transactions, you post in the T account, that tells you the ending balance. For CPA exam questions, you need to set your questions up like this and not default nearly as much to trying to answer those with T accounts, okay? So we have what? We have the beginning balance. We add whatever should be added to that account. We subtract whatever should be subtracted from that account, and that gives us the ending balance. So now, if the problem gives us the ending balance and says there was a fire, they can't figure out what the beginning balance was, you can do what? You can work your way back up to what the beginning balance was, okay? So you come over, and let's just take a look at that in the context of accounts receivable. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm gonna walk you through this and I'm going to do it using journal entries and T accounts, just so you see the connection between the way you use the blank account analysis and what you're used to using, which is journal entries and T accounts. On the exam, they give you a set of information, you would do it this way, okay? Now, having said that, I'm gonna start with the T account. This is the accounts receivable and it has a beginning balance of 90,000. So I got to start with that balance, right? Okay, so they give me the beginning balance of 90,000, and then they have credit sales of 800,000. So what would I do? I would debit accounts receivable for 800,000, and I would credit sales for 800,000, right? Okay, now when I come over to my T account, I'm just showing you how that would be posted as, and I don't know why I wrote my line so far over there. Okay, that would be posted as 800,000, right? Maybe so far, okay, no big deal, okay? Then they tell me that the cash collected was 810,000, okay? So what I would do is I would of course do what? Debit cash, 810,000, and of course, that's going to be a credit to my accounts receivable. So that's a subtract, I credit it, 810, okay? Then they tell me that they had converted some accounts receivable to note receivable. Account receivable is usually a verbal agreement, but if somebody, hey, they can't pay and they're saying, I'm having a little trouble paying, can you cut me some slack? You might say, okay, but we're gonna to have to formalize that into a written note, okay? So if that happens, then what? 
then we would go ahead and debit the note receivable, what are they saying, 7,000 there, and credit the account receivable. Okay, I don't see that as much on CPA exam questions, but it is something that can happen in practice that, you know, somebody has to, uh, you know, get something in writing or maybe someone's having a little trouble paying, okay? Then what? Then we have 23,000 of accounts receivable that were written off. Now, if that's the case, you debit, and we're going to talk more about the allowance here in a little while, you debit the allowance for doubtful accounts, what is it, 23,000? And you credit the account receivable. And of course, now I wrote that in a place that's gonna screw me up. You credit the account receivable, 23,000, that's a credit. And I write it over here on the credit side, guys. I just don't get confused there. I'm not trying to write on the debit side. I just so happen to not use good planning as to where I wrote that. So that's a credit to the account receivable. And when you do that, you get what? You get the ending balance of 50,000. Now, when you look at this, the important thing is for you to know how these different things affect the account receivable, because they may ask me, they'll give me all of the everything, but they'll ask me, what were the credit sales? So now I'm going to have to work my way back up to figure out what the credit sales were, right? And you can't use a T account for that, okay? So you have to realize that credit sales are an ad the amount of the write-off, they say, well, what was written off? They'll give me everything else. I'm going to have to work my way back up to figure out what the write-off was, right? That's how you work questions on the CPA exam. Do not sit there and try to use T accounts for questions like this. You're going to run into trouble. Question? Okay, good. Now you come over and you take a look at um, cash discounts. Okay. And when they talk about discount terms, guys, I'm not trying to insult anyone's intelligence. I know you know this, but just to quickly review, this 210 net 30 means that they'll give a 2% discount if the thing is paid in 10 days. Otherwise, they have to pay the whole amount in 30 days, right? Okay. Now, when we have discounts, we can record our sale either gross or net, we use the gross method or the net method. Now, when we use the gross method, okay, and they have $100,000 of accounts receivable, 210 net 30, 2% discount if paid within 10 days, right? Otherwise pay the whole amount in 30 days. Now let's look at the gross method first. You debit the account receivable for the gross amount of receivable. You're not worried about the discount. If the discount is taken, of course, 100,000 times 2% is a $2,000 discount. You would debit the cash for the full cash you got. You will credit the account receivable for 100,000, and then you'll debit this account called sales discounts taken, 2,000. Now, the way we'll probably report our sales on the balance, um, on the income statement would be the net sales, but just to see how that would look, it'd be sales right? Less discounts. The discount is what? 2,000. So the net sales is 98,000. And many, many companies, they kind of start with net sales on their income statement. If you pick up Apple's financial report, they're not going to show you sales minus discounts. They're just going to show you net sales, right? And then maybe somewhere they might footnote any discounts or returns that are associated with that. Okay. Now, if the amount is, um, uh, is not received within the discount period, then of course you simply do what? Debit the cash and credit the account receivable. Nothing to that. Okay. Now, if it's net, we assume that the discount is going to be taken. So we debit the account receivable 98,000, we credit the cash 98,000. If they pay within the discount period, no problem, debit the cash, credit the receivable. If they what take, they pay not in the discount period, right? Well, now we're going to debit the cash 100,000, we'll credit the receivable 98,000, and we will credit an account called sales discounts not taken, 
And in this situation, this account is closed to sales. In other words, at the end of the year, we'll debit this account and credit the sale account so that the sales then would show the 400,000 that was collected in this example. Um, the only reason a company would do it this way is they want to see how often their discount is taken when they do this. And if they're saying that most people are rejecting their discount, they might try to sweeten that a little bit, right? So some way they probably want to keep track of whether or not the discount is taken either using the net or the gross method. Question? Okay, good. Now, trade discounts and when we talk about trade discounts i'm just going to put up here macy's okay macy's you guys heard of macy's macy's department store you ever been there okay and you go over to macy's department store and you see a shirt that you really really like and you see this shirt and it says 40 percent discount and then they put another little hoopty on top of the 40% discount sign that says an additional 10% taken at the register. And you think, oh boy, oh boy, 50% discount. And then you get up to the stand and what do they do? The checkout stand, what do they do? They take a 40% discount on the original price and they take what? A 10% discount on the already discounted price. And by then you go ahead and you buy the shirt anyway, because you've determined while you were waiting in line that that shirt was gonna change your life, right? Okay, so what happens? The CPA exam tries to do the same thing to you. They try to trick you into adding the discounts together. Now, no, you first take the discount on the original price and then you take the 10% additional, whatever it is, I'm using the fact from this problem, the additional 10% uh, on the already discounted price. So let's just look at this example, okay? And we have these coats and they're gonna sell them, thousand each coat, a hundred coats, a thousand times a hundred is a hundred thousand. They do what? They take a 40% discount off the original price. That brings the what? Price down to 60,000. And then that second discount is taken on the what? already discounted price, so it's 54,000, okay? Sometimes students will ask me, why did they do it, take them in two pieces? That's the whole point of this example, right? You take them in two pieces, okay? Okay, good. Now, big point area here, guys, is the estimating uncollectible, uncollectability of accounts receivable. What is the rule here? The rule is if you offer credit sales, if you offer credit sales, you have to assume that some people will not pay you. And you have to gather some data over time to see what, how often, how frequently when you offer credit sales, people won't pay you. At the time that you make the sale, you have to take a bad debt expense so you match that sale with that estimate of the amount that's not going to be collectible because the event that triggers the uncollectible is what is the sale not the person telling you they can't pay you. so for that reason the direct write-off method is not gap no bad cpa no don't do this I'm going to say bad CPA. Do not do this. No, do never write off the uh, bad debt like this. Debit the bad debt expense, credit the receivable. You have to use what? You have to use the allowance method, meaning that you will take the, the allowance and the bad debt expense at the time of sale. So you match that bad debt with the sale. Now, sometimes students will say to me, well, will there ever be a situation where the um, expected bad debt is zero? And I ask my students, will there ever be world peace? And the answer to both questions is no. There will always be some shit that happens that causes you to have to take an amount of the allowance. The only way to avoid any uh, bad debt 
is don't offer credit sales. Only do cash sales. Then you'll never have a bad debt, right? Okay. Otherwise, there will always be bad debt. And certainly on the CPA exam, there will always be bad debt. Okay. Now, what we need to do is we need to look at the balance in the account receivable account at the end of the year and use our experience to determine how much of that do we think will go bad, will go into a bad debt expense, okay? Now, if we are sitting there and we're going to just use 2% of the total balance, we say, well, if the balance is 80,000 and based on past experience, 2% of that goes bad, then we would go ahead and we'd say, okay, we need 1600 in the allowance account. And if there is already a thousand in there, then we need to what? We need to add 600 to that. The allowance is a contra asset account, so it's a credit. And we debit the bad debt expense for 600. Now on the balance sheet, we'll report what? We'll report accounts receivable of 80,000. We'll report an allowance of what? 1600. Okay, that's the allowance. If this was the allowance, it started with what? It started with 1000. We determined we needed an ending balance in there. I'll just write it over. Eh, I'll, I'll write out the balance side. Balance, it started what? With a thousand. We determined that we needed how much in there? 1600 based on our experience. So what do we do? We have to credit it for six. That's that credit right there. And you debit the bad debt expense. Of course, bad debt expense, expense gets reported where? Hello, my future CPAs. Do we know where expenses are reported? Income statement. That goes to the income statement. Good. Okay. Okay, good. Now you come over and a more sophisticated way would be to do an aging of the receivable. And all we do here is we put more into the allowance depending on how delinquent that has become. The later, more delinquent it comes, becomes the more likely they're not going to pay us. Now, in this example, which probably would not be in practice, they come up with the same answer as what the 2% for the total was um, that you know wouldn't be very likely. But if you came up with the same answer, you would again debit that debt expense for 600 and credit the allowance for 600 like we saw up there. Okay. They used to have a method called percentage of sales. FASB abolished that. I want to say they got rid of that around 2000. I don't know, it was around 2017 or something like that. They got rid of that because it was stupid. And I used to tell everybody it was stupid that they even had that method. And I used to teach at uh, community college in Fremont. And I'd get into back and forth because the instructors there thought that it would be okay if a company just put an amount in the allowance based on their sales and didn't do some sort of analysis to catch up by the end of the year to look of the receivables that are still outstanding, what percent do we think is going to go bad and make the adjustment like we've seen to the ending balance of the account receivable accordingly. And I used to make the point to them, well, what if they collected all of their receivables by the end of the year? Should there still be an amount in the allowance based on the sales? And the answer would be no, because they collected everything. So there's no more outstanding receivables to go bad. And I'd sit there and have that argument. And I'd finally say, let me shut up. I'm going to quit here at the end of this semester anyway, because they don't know what they're doing here. So anyway, FASB finally caught up with me and said, we're getting rid of that percentage of sales method. Okay. Now I tell that silly little story because it gets a little bit confusing here when you look at this example, because in this example, they do take a provision into the bad debt expense and the allowance based on sale during the year. But we're going to see that by the end of the year, they do what? 
they make that required adjustment along the lines of what we were looking at in those two previous examples. Okay, so what we're going to do is see how to use the account analysis format. That's what this is. This is the blank account format that we talked about for receivables a minute ago. And we're going to take that information and see uh, how we would use it to answer a question. Now, as we go through this, I'm going to show you the journal entries and I'm going to use a T account for the allowance at the same time, just so you see the connection between the blank account analysis format and the T account. Not, I'm, not, I'm not telling you to use a T account, I'm telling you, I'm showing you for comparison purposes, okay? So they tell us that what, there was a beginning balance of 20,000. Okay, and of course you don't have to make a journal entry for the beginning balance, 20,000. Okay, now, even though we must make an adjustment at year end using either the aging or the percentage of the receivable, in this question, they told us, well, they take provisions during the year, okay? For, based on their sales. So they had sales of 700,000. They thought 2% of that based on their experience would go bad. So what did they do? They went ahead and they debited. Yeah, in this question, they don't show you. I'm just gonna show you the journal entry. They debited bad debt expense for 14,000 and they credit the allowance. Okay, so if a question gives me the bad debt expense, I know that that is what? That's an add to the allowance. Okay, now I'm just going to tee up bad debt expense here at the same time. So that was a debit for 14,000. Okay, all right, good. Then the question tells us they wrote off 12,500. Now, when I look at that write off of the 12,500, okay, you can see the journal entry down here. You credit the account receivable, you debit the allowance for the 12,5. So now I'm posting that up. Okay, now after I have done this, I have a balance in the allowance account of 21,500. Now, as I said, as I used to argue community college in Fremont, you can't stop there. You gotta do an aging at that point and you gotta see or whatever, some analysis, aging is the most common. These days, you know, with data analytics, they have, you know, you can gather data for years and come up with how your accounts receivable will matriculate to uh, an uncollectible status, right? So the more sophisticated, I was on an assignment where we were looking at the allowance for a loan loss. Congress wanted us to look at that because they were worried that banks were under-reporting what the amount was that was going to go bad on debts and the um, congress was worried about that because what it could impact the um the uh insurance the fdic and there could be this big monster out there looming that all of a sudden the federal government's going to have to back all these deposits and commercial real estate was the concern back in the early 90s what we ended up finding is they were actually over reserving they were putting more in there than their analysis indicated. And they were doing that so that later on, when things weren't going as well, they could put less in the allowance, take a smaller bad debt expense. And they were using that as a means to manage uh, their profits, which we didn't like that. Anyway, so uh, you can't stop there. You have to do this analysis. And when they do, they do an aging whatever, and they determine that the desired balance is 20,500. Do I have too much or not enough? Do I have too much or not enough? Too much. I got too much. If you ever go to Starbucks and you ask for room for cream, I don't know if this ever happens to you, and they just fill it up to the top. You say, I asked for room for cream, and they put it right up to the top. What do you do? You dump some out so you can fit the cream in there, right? 
okay, well, we're just going to dump a little bit out of the allowance by doing what? By debiting the allowance for a thousand. When I debit the allowance for a thousand, that brings the balance down to the desired what? 20,500. So I'm cool there. And I credit the bad debt expense. So a question could give you a fact pattern like this and at the end ask you for the bad debt expense for the period and the answer is going to be what? 13,000. Okay, so don't fall into the trap of thinking that it's okay to just take the sales times the percentage of the sales and say there that's the bad debt expense you always got to look to see if that needs to be adjusted and it could be that they have to put more in right if it said hey you need twenty two thousand in there then the bad debt expense for the period would have been fourteen five right because you would have had to put more in okay now i went past a couple of entries that i want to go back to here okay and uh, we've already seen that when you write off an account, you debit the allowance, you credit the account receivable, okay? Um, and um, direct write-off method, no. This is not how you do it. You don't debit cash and credit the receivable. You set up the allowance um, for the purpose, huh? What's going on here? What the hell are they doing here? Debit, cash, credit, uncollectible accounts recovered. Okay. Yeah, don't do that. I don't know what the hell they're doing there. Just ignore that. No, don't just leave the no there. Okay. What we do is if we collect a receivable that was subsequently collected under the allowance method, which is what we're supposed to do, you'd first debit the receivable and credit the allowance, bringing back the receivable and putting that money back into the allowance. Now, sometimes students have a problem with that credit to the allowance part because they're like, well, John, why are you putting that back in the allowance? Well, look, we put amounts in the allowance for people who really can't pay, that based on our experience, really won't be able to pay us. If somebody, what, says they can't pay us, we write it off and then they hit the lottery and they come back and they say, hey, I'm gonna pay you, then we're not putting amounts in the allowance for them. That's not the people we're putting amounts and allowance for. So we put it back in, right? And then we go ahead and we, of course, now are receiving the cash on that. So we debit the cash, we credit the accounts receivable. Okay. So make sure you are comfortable, guys, with the entire process. Okay. And if you have to flashcard all these entries, then do that. Okay. When you set up the allowance, you debit the bad debt expense, you credit the allowance, right? When you have the write-off, what do you do? When you have the write-off, you debit the allowance, you credit the account receivable. If you have to make an adjustment, you make an appropriate adjustment, increase or decrease in the bad debt expense, increase or decrease in the allowance accordingly. If there's a recovery, you need to do what? You need to put the receivable back, put that money back in the allowance, and then Go ahead and, of course, liquidate the receivable by debiting the cash, creating the receivable. Make sure you are comfortable with that process, guys. 10 points on the exam, and I'm here to tell you that you probably don't wake up in the morning with that information bouncing around in your head. So I need some flashcards on that so that when you get on the exam, it's easy for you. It should be easy, and that's an easy 10 points. That's going to race you ahead of a lot of your uh, competition on the exam. Okay, question. Really? I hate that when that happens. Okay, well, we're not going to um, finish this module. So uh, we'll pick up with notes receivable or whatever, wherever we're at now, uh, pledging of accounts receivable, I guess. We'll pick up here at 1.7 next time because we don't have time and I don't want to rush it. So just worry about finishing chapter two homework now and at least the first module of chapter three. And we'll pick up um, here in the middle of module two next time. Okay, guys. Question. 
All righty. We will see you next week. Have a good rest of the week. Study hard. Yeah. Get through your homework, okay? I'm going to be checking. I promise you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Bye-bye. Anh nêu cho à? Ừ, đây ạ. Em có không ạ?